Senechal. I'm the Program and Development Coordinator here at the library. And I've been very pleased to work with uh, the League of Women Voters, Sue Racanelli, who is here tonight, um, and Kate Miller, who couldn't be here tonight because of uh, family, a uh, death in her family. And we're very uh, sad about that. And this series has been on the First Amendment, and it's been a great series, and we've had really wonderful people here to uh, talk about various issues about the, the different First Amendments. Um, and I want to thank Sue uh, for helping to organize this and every other program in the series. And uh, Sue will, in turn, um, introduce tonight's moderator, who will, in turn, introduce tonight's presenters. So please help me welcome Sue Racanelli. Thank you, Rachel. As many of you know, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. We were founded in 1920 and will proudly be celebrating our 100th year in 2020. We are delighted you could join us this evening to hear our program on freedom to petition the government for a redress of grievances. This is the final presentation in our series on the First Amendment. It is my pleasure to welcome Carrie Brown, who will be our moderator this evening. Carrie is Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women. She worked in the field of gender equity in Vermont since the mid-1990s, including the Vermont Technical College and Vermont Works for Women. Her early days were spent as an educator, and she has a master's degree in public administration. Carrie lives in Montpelier with her family, where she is a justice of the peace. Carrie, if you'd like to take over and introduce us to the panel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out tonight to hear about the Constitution. There is no better topic that we could be talking about, but, right, than the Constitution. What is more important than this? Um, I am very pleased to be here. The Vermont Commission on Women uh, is a state agency. We work to increase opportunities and reduce discrimination for women and girls across Vermont. And so fundamental rights are at the heart of what we do. And uh, I am very excited to be here, partly because when I was a kid, my hope was to grow up to be a Supreme Court justice one day. And I think this might be the closest I've gotten so far. So <laughs> thank you for this opportunity. So uh, tonight we're going to have, each of our panelists will have about 15 minutes to talk about different aspects of this particular part of the First Amendment. And then after that we'll have time for questions and discussion. So I will introduce everybody right now so you know who's up here, and then we'll go one by one, and they'll take their turns talking about their particular topics. So we have, our first speaker will be Professor Peter Teachout. He's a professor at Vermont Law School. He's recognized for his expertise regarding the constitutional and history of Vermont and the United States. Professor Teachout received his bachelor's degree from Amherst College, his JD degree from Harvard Law School, and a master's degree from the University of Sussex. He joined the Vermont Law School faculty in 1975. His expertise has been frequently tapped by Vermont's legislature and judiciary, which has sought his testimony and advice on the balanced budget amendment, flag desecration legislation, the redrafting of the state constitution in gender neutral language, for which I have to say the Vermont Commission on Women is very thankful, the education financing and civil union legislation. And he will, well, I'll tell you a little bit more about what he's going to say. Um, our second panelist is Paul Gillies, who is, um, uh, works for Tarrant Gillies and Richardson, and he's been there since January of 1993, and he joined that firm after 12 years as Dep Deputy Secretary of State for Vermont. His practice involves most of the usual civil areas of law, including municipal zoning and land use, property, appellate, and trial work. He has a special fascination for old roads, boundary lines, rights of way, and other easements, and that special land where history collides with law, which I think is going to be quite appropriate tonight. And then our third panelist is John Franco. John Franco is a native of Vermont. He has more than 35 years' experience in public service. 40. 40? More than 40? No, 40. Exactly 40, 40 years 40. experience yeah. in public service. 
His private law practice is dedicated to serving the needs of working Vermonters and small business. So we are going to start with Professor Teachout, who's going to give us a little bit of a historical context for tonight. So I am going to ask you to address a few broad issues here. We want to hear about the origins of the right to petition in the Anglo-American constitutional tradition. We want to hear a little bit about the relationship that this right to petition has to other rights, such as speech, uh, press, assembly, that are addressed in the First Amendment. And a little bit about kind of the historical progression of our thoughts about those rights and how they came to be. Thank you, Carrie. Can you hear me OK? Well, I would be remiss in beginning without, first of all, thanking all of you for taking the time to show up this evening. It's not the most exciting right in the First Amendment, but it is a very important one, as we shall come to see. And equally important, as I think we will stress in our presentation tonight, is a parallel provision in the Vermont Constitution, which my colleague Paul Gillies will talk about in much more detail. I'd also be remiss if I did not share with you the special resonance that this library has for me. When I was a little kid, going to kindergarten and first grade in the Union School, this library was on my route home. I had to walk through the State House and then up Clarendon Avenue. I think some of you know where that is. And on my way home, after school, I would stop in what was then the children's library, which was downstairs at that point in time. And I would sit on the floor, consumed by books, even before I knew how to read. Uh, and as I got a little bit older, I read every single book in this library about <laughs> boys. George Washington, boy statesman. John Paul Jones, boy mariner. <laughs> John Marshall, boy adventurer. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, boy stockbroker. I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, if there's, when I come here, I, I, I think, I can't think of any other place in my whole life that in some ways probably had a more powerful shaping influence on my education, on who I've become, for whatever it's worth, but it's just a tremendously nice resonance. I think probably some of you remember the libraries that occupied you and engaged you when you were small children as well. So I want to begin tonight by sharing with you a paradox of sort. Of all of the rights that are mentioned in the First Amendment, free exercise, non-establishment, right to free speech, freedom of press, right of assembly. The one right that has the most ancient and venerable heritage is the right to petition. I'll explain why. The paradox is that today, of all of those rights, in some ways, the right to petition has become the least significant. Now, when I say least significant, I don't want to imply not significant. I'm just saying if you read the books, you read the cases, you'll find it's one of the least litigated and one of the least significant provisions in, in the First Amendment. So how can that be? The most venerable, the most ancient right of all those mentioned in the First Amendment, but yet today, in some ways, the least significant. So that's what I'd like to basically trace with you in my introductory remarks this evening. And I want to begin by carrying us all the way back to the origins of the right to petition. I'm sure we can go back further, but one of the major moments in Anglo-American history was the meeting of the Lords with the King in at Runnymede Meadows in 1215, at the time of the signing of the Magna Carta. One of the main purposes of that meeting and those negotiations between the king and his knights was over the right to petition. Among the grievances that the lords had, I'll give you just one example. At that time, it was a practice of the king when a knight 
died, a knight that owed him fealty died, if he was married, the king would take his property and either give it or sell it to somebody else, leaving his widow penniless. And one of the things that was negotiated at Runnymede was that doesn't seem right, that's a grievance. And it was one of the terms of the agreement that was worked out at that time. If we move fast forward to our own colonial history, by the way, I've handed out two sheets, and if you want to track very roughly my comments, you'll find on the first sheet, you will find at the top both the language of the First Amendment and also the language of Article 20 of Chapter 1 of the Vermont Constitution, which contains a parallel provision in the Vermont Constitution. So my comments from this point forward will be sort of tracking that very crude outline at the bottom of that same page. So I've mentioned the Magna Carta. Fast forward to the colonial period. One of the most influential books for lawyers and for citizens generally in the colonies during the 1760s was a work by William Blackstone called Commentaries on the Law of England. At that point in time, the colonies followed English law. They had no, they had some independent law of their own, but the dominant source of law was English law. And this is before the Declaration of Independence. If you read Blackstone commentaries, you will find this. The right of petitioning the king or either house of parliament for the redress of grievances is, quote, a right appertaining to every individual. That was a fundamental right. If you read the Declaration of Independence, you will find that one of the major grievances of the colonist was the lack of response of the king and parliament to petitions for redress of grievances by the colonists. I will quote from the Declaration. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. Yeah, a nice way of putting things down. <laughs> a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. So you can see the centrality of this notion of a right to petition and a right to get at least a response to petitions in which that requested redress of grievances, okay? So what happens after that? How can we explain then that today the right to petition does not hold a great as much significance as any of the other rights in the First Amendment? Well, one of the things that's really interesting is during the period following the Declaration of Independence, every state at that point had to somehow rip up the old colonial charters and adopt for the first time in Anglo-American history written constitutions. These are the very first constitutions in our experience. And most of those constitutions had two components. One was a Declaration of Rights, and the other was called a frame of government, which talked about legislature, executive body, and so on and so forth. If you look at those early state constitutions, it's pretty significant that all of them by that time included a strong statement about the importance of freedom of the press. Freedom of the press during the time of the revolutionary period was thought of as the great bulwark of liberty. But only one of those state constitutions, Pennsylvania, had a provision protecting freedom of speech. So this is kind of an incubation period in which these grievances, notions of rights of English persons are beginning to appear in state constitutions. But at that point in time, you had the right to petition and the right of free speech, perhaps a right of assembly. But except for one state, Pennsylvania, no right of freedom of speech. There was a republic during that time called the Republic of Vermont. In the Republic of Vermont, the first constitution did protect the right of free speech, but it was an anomaly in that sense. So, 
So during the next decade, between declaration and adopt adoption of the Constitution and then adoption of the Bill of Rights in 1791, we begin to see this understanding of the whole group of rights coming into focus. They become crystallized. And what they reflect, interestingly, is a radical transformation in political thought between, say, the mid-1600s, when Parliament and the King are having it out in England, and the mid-1700s. And what's the nature of that transformation? Because it's absolutely crucial to understanding this whole development. If you look at my little outline, you, I, this is kind of a little bit simplistic, but it actually is accurate. During the mid 1600s, the basic conception of political organization was one, a hierarchical one. There was a king up there, and down below were his subjects, right? By the mid 1700s, in part due to a whole number of factors, including the experience in the American colonies, that relationship is totally reversed. By the time these state constitutions are being written, you'll find exactly the opposite understanding of the relationship of the people to government authorities. And I've included on the other handout, I don't know that I kept a copy. We don't have any extra. <laughs> Um, a, a, section on, a section that you will find in virtually every state constitution during this time. It seems like such a cliche to us, so ordinary that we'd say, how could that possibly be revolutionary? But I will tell you, at this point in time, it was a kind of revolutionary statement. And the statement was a very simple one. It's called trustees and servants that all power being originally inherent in and consequently derived from the people, therefore, all officers of government, whether legislative or executive, are their trustees and servants, and at all times, in a legal way, accountable to them. So you see an absolute flip-flop of the relationship between rulers and people in that 100-year span. And that is reflected in the Vermont Constitution and in the federal constitution in a myriad of different ways. A requirement that government be open to examination. Free speech, freedom of the press, they're also reflections of that same thing. Underlying that all is a notion that government officials are accountable and need to be held accountable to the people. So what happens to the good old right to petition during this time? it gradually loses a kind of significance it once had when it was the sole basis for challenging government actions. Now suddenly we see the right of freedom of the press rising to the top, free speech rising to the top, a judicially created right of association that is related to the right of free speech and freedom of the press. And so these rights then become the primary ways in which all of us can then express our challenges, our grievances, and so on by themselves without needing to resort to the right to petition, which at one point in time was the sole way of doing so. So I want to close then by well, let me make one further point. I don't know if any of you studied law, but the constitutional textbook that I use today is 1,800 pages long. Okay, it is that fat. If you look at that textbook, you will not find a single case, a single major federal constitutional case involving the right to petition. If you look through the index of that 1,800-page casebook, you will not find the right to petition even mentioned, okay? So something has happened, and as I've tried to suggest, its relevance and significance, generally speaking, 
has diminished as these other rights have come to sort of take over and do the work that the right to petition had to do all by itself in a much earlier period. Finally, if you'll take a look at the handout with the language of the First Amendment and the language of the parallel provision in the Vermont Constitution, you'll notice that there are certain parallels, but you'll also notice there are certain differences. And differences that I think Paul Gillies will, will tell us are extremely important. So let's, we know what the First Amendment provides, let's just take a moment to read Article 20 of the Vermont Constitution. We borrowed this or stole it from the Pennsylvania Constitution the way we stole most of the other provisions in the first Vermont Constitution, word for word, but there it is, that the people have a right to assemble together to consult for their common good, to instruct their representatives, and to apply to the legislature for redress of grievances by address petition or remonstrance. Now, what's the difference? Is there any significance difference that flows from the different language in the federal constitutional provision and the state provision? I will now turn the floor over to Paul Gillies to tell you a very interesting story why. You ready? Well, I feel like I'm in the law school class. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me, let me just get, some, get a little bit into it before we, we start there. In my uh, experience, I was uh, a selectman in uh, Berlin and chair for three years. I was JP for eight years. I was deputy secretary for 12 years. And in all that time, one message became clear to me, which is that government that ignores what the people want is in trouble. And it causes problems, not only the loyalty of the citizens, but also the respect for the government and a sense of uh, separateness that keeps us from each other. Uh, and this right to petition, this right to bring your concerns to the government to see if you can have a response, is, uh, in my mind, so critical to the continuance of, of good government that government ought to be able to respond. Government, like anyone, is offended when you uh, oppose it or you uh, criticize it. And uh, there are systems that are designed so that we don't get the kind of constructive dialogue that we should have. Sam Frank Bryan, a uh, professor at UVM, has smartly said that there's a significant difference between a public hearing and a town meeting. Because at a town meeting, you have control. And at a, at a hearing, you get to say what you have to say. And then there's no necessary reaction or dialogue. Blowing off steam. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the, uh, Peter's explanation of the uh, of the federal constitutional matter is uh, is very clear to those of us who are now waging a battle in South Burlington, and it, and it may seem like a quotidian matter, but to uh, 800 or 900 former graduates of South Burlington High School, the name. Rebels made sense. The guys that got their letter jackets that said rebels, all of a sudden it became politically incorrect because it sounded as though it was racist. And the, and the school board decided to change it to, uh, unfortunately, they chose to change it to wolves, which probably has some other problems of itself. And the people rose up and petitioned them to have a, a vote to take a, 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 a vote on a non-binding referendum, a non-binding article that would say, how do you think? Would you like to have the name changed or not? And the uh, background of this is that uh, the uh, issue had been broiling for years. The school board had actually taken a position not to change it. And then without proper notice, they changed it one night. The next school budget, which included express language to change, which was something like $180,000 to change the signs and the, all the stuff that goes with it, uh, failed. The second budget had that as well. It failed. The third time they took it out, and it passed. But they made no change to do that. So we went to court, and we went to the Superior Court, where <clears throat> we had now Stepping back, we have a long history going back 30 or 40 years in Vermont 
of courts saying no to petitioners. And a lot of times it was justified because sometimes they wanted to change the, the, the person that did the public accounts. Sometimes they, they thought, why don't we pick three of us from the, government, oh, from the people and we'll replace the listers so we got a fair grand list. You can imagine how that grand list would have been put together. Could I ask a question just to clarify? Sure. Is this take the form of a petition to put an article on a warrant? And is it a school board warrant or is it a town warrant? It's a school board district warning that they hope to have a special election or a, an annual meeting where they would have a vote on this question. And they had to supply it with 5% signatures of the voters. And it was repudiated. And it was justified by saying that it was only within the discretion of the school board as to what kind of articles of non-binding nature would be placed before the voters. And that was the ruling of the Supreme Court in a case heard several years before, which I was also involved in, where they declared, incidentally from South Burlington itself, that a lady who had circulated a petition that got 5% of the voters who wanted to have a question as to whether there was support in the city for a, 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 a early notification of uh, childhood abortion. A, a, a necessarily a right-wing issue, but all she wanted to do was to put it before them. The court said no. The Supreme Court said absolutely no. But they said that this, the uh, city council could put something on if they wanted. And South Burlington had a long history of nuclear freeze and of uh, Guatemala, you know, South America, a lot of issues over the time, political issues, and this city has had many times where you've had political issues there. But the, old, the ultimate ruling at this juncture was that the uh, city council or the select board could decide it. Uh, so we're uh, two weeks away from oral argument. The briefs have been submitted, and uh, we are focusing not on the statute, which had been declared uh, in uh, declared different from what it seemed to say, which is you could put a non-binding article on the warning. And we have turned to Article 20 of the Vermont Constitution, which, as Peter has said, ha has uh, no history. It has no history in Vermont. And the and First Amendment doesn't have any history in the country. So where are we going to get the history? And there's an analysis we'll go through. And, and the, uh, the interesting part of this is that the uh, Article 20 uh, de there is some use in Vermont. Uh, there was a long history until the uh, 1800 of people petitioning the legislature for uh, declare me so I don't get sued by my creditors, or let me get out of jail, or even as, as, as onerous as give me a new trial, or allow a piece of evidence to be admitted that a court has kept out. And the Supreme Court, in the, by 1826, had declared that as an unconstitutional matter, and petitions then slowed down and stopped. But what the people in South Burlington wanted to do was to have a, a, an opportunity to just express their opinion. They did not expect that they would make the decision to change that rule. As the Judge Mello said in his decision in the Superior Court, the uh, there, it, this is an enforceable, and a non-binding article is enforceable at the next election day. If you feel strongly enough that people didn't respond to what you, are, you had expressed as an opinion, then you should be able to uh, take them out. But there's no mandamus or no action which would force the school board in South Burlington to change, the, to change their mind on the expression of that. So we, so we have uh, an important uh, decision coming up in the Supreme Court. Previously, all of the decisions that have come before have been generally discouraging to people from the petitioning side. I'll go back to my central point, which is that, that government needs to breathe. It needs, it needs to be a dialogue. There can't, you, the, the, we can't have the king in the form of boards lording over the servants, which are the voters who, who, to whom they answer. Um, so we have a situation where we have a chance to change things by looking at the Constitution, and the Constitution is sort of a blank slate. One of the issues that has come out, which has been briefed and argued over and over, and will no doubt come out in the, in the oral argument, is whether the word representatives in Article 4 is capitalized or not. And those who say that the school board is right say that 
capital R representatives means people that serve in the legislature. It has no relationship to the uh, to the uh, to a town meeting. Don't you just love it? Now, I went through every published version of the Vermont Constitution, including the first one that Ira Allen arranged to have published in Connecticut so we could have a government. And there is no consistency. The first, I appreciate this, 1777 and 1786, lowercase r, 1793, capital R, and then since 1880, capital R. So what are we going to do with that? But, I, I'm using up my time. It's time to go to John, but I, and I don't know that I answered Peter's question, but uh, I, I managed to avoid them usually in law school, so maybe I do the same now. Well, I would just like you to consult Article 20 and just notice that there, in fact, are two provisions in Article 20. One is a right to petition the legislature for redress of grievances. But there's the second provision on which Paul's case rests, which is the right to instruct their representatives. So it's kind of interesting we're talking about the right to position. There's a unique provision in the Vermont Constitution which gives the people a right to instruct their representatives. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm John Franco. Again, um, I, uh, I do a lot of, uh, frankly, a lot of constitutional law. I have at least two cases uh, on the stove in any given year that are, uh, that are either civil rights or constitutional issues. Um, and I'm sort of a practi uh, practitioner in this stuff. Um, and maybe later this evening we can talk about some of my uh, frustrated, grumpy old man views about how uh, these rights are treated by the courts. Uh, you know, first I want to comment about Paul's case. When I first heard about the decision and read it, my first reaction was, uh, Paul and Judge Mello are out of their cotton picking minds. What were they thinking of here? And the reason for that is, is an, I, I got burned in this case myself once, way, way, way back. There's a case called uh, Royalton Taxpayer Association versus Wasserman-Dorf. And the reason I remember Royalton Taxpayer Association is because I was going to law, Vermont Law School getting constitutional law from this guy in, in South Royalton. Um, and that said, no, 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 it's not within the purview, it's not within the power of the, uh, of the select board to do what you're asking them to do, and it's, the term was nugatory or nugatory. I love that word. What was different about Paul's case is they said, well, wait a minute, you're, you're instructing, you have a right to instruct the, uh, the school board about how you feel and something that they have authority to do something about. And this had to do with the changing of the name from rebels to uh, wolves. And the other thing I will, I will tell you, I will confess that my first reaction was I wasn't terribly enthralled politically with, or, or sympathetic politically with, with, uh, with, with the plaintiffs in the case. But I read it, when I read it the second time, I said, this is interesting. And then the third time I read it, frankly, Paul, I said, this is brilliant. And I think it's a really, no, it really is. And I think it's a really important precedent in the state of Vermont. And let me follow up on that. Um, that had significant and immediate repercussions in the city of Burlington because there has been an ongoing controversy about the location of the F-35 fighters at the Burlington Airport. And um, a number of enterprising opponents um, circulated petitions, and 5% uh, of the voters in Burlington is a lot because the, the voter list is so inflated with all the students that registered for Barack Obama and then left, and they, haven't, you know, they never really keep the rules up. So when they got a petition of 5% of the voters to have this, to have the, the, the at town meeting to consider a question of whether or not, uh, basically whether the F-35 should be uh, uh, cited in, uh, in the city of Burlington. Or whether the city, city council should do something, I forget exactly what it was, as keep in mind that the airport in South Burlington is a department of the city of Burlington, so it was within the, within the city council's jurisdiction, which was important about Paul's case. Now what happened with that and what's significant politically was there was an effort by people that opposed that petition and supported the F-35. They were saying this petition is um, not, uh, it's, 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 it's biased and it's slanted and it's wording and the city council should change it and rewrite it. And that didn't, um, that effort was not successful because the majority of the city council was persuaded based upon Paul's case that they had to take the petition as it was circulated and signed. If you start, you as the city council start amending it, you're not honoring their right to instruct their representatives. So that was, uh, I think, very uh, significant. The other, the other kind of general point I want to make, and then we can open it up to some discussion. 
I couldn't agree more with Peter about uh, what happened to the right to petition. I recently have been involved in litigation right now in, in federal court, um, which involved the, the, what we thought was a denial of my client's due process rights to be heard uh, to take an appeal uh, through the uh, zoning processes that are, that are provided by the Planning Act. And one of the things I looked at, because the right of, right of petition is not just legislative, the right of petition is recognized as also a First Amendment right. Looking at the case law that, what it, what it provides you, nothing. I mean nothing, I just abandoned it. I, I just said, no, this isn't worth pursuing. What you have to do is you have to show you have a property right now, right was denied through the denial of notice and due process and so forth and so on. The, the thing about the right to petition, it would have been a much more expansive argument and I wouldn't have to, uh, you know, wouldn't have to make the proof or showing of what's called a property right, whatever that means. Um, so I think it, it has fallen by the wayside uh, at least directly, uh, maybe in the discussion a little later, we can talk about how it still exists sort of underground in various, uh, in various formats, particularly in uh, public document cases, which I think are very significant. I think it's very closely related to that. So maybe we can open it up for discussion now. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really struck by in uh, listening to all this and in reading ahead of time is how this is, this is a right that we don't really talk about. Um, most of us don't hear much about it. We don't, it sounds like it's not really used very much, but it really goes to the absolute heart of democracy. That this is really at the, the fundamental level of what it means for the people to be in charge. And so I'm very encouraged to hear about the, the progress that you're making and the ways that we have to use this right. And it, makes sense when you talk about the historical context that it's not, that it's sort of faded away. I can see why that happened, but it's still there, right? It didn't actually go away, it's still there, and so we still have that to draw on. So I would love to have an opportunity for folks in the audience, if you have some questions, you can ask and we can continue this discussion. Does anyone have anything they want to ask about or say? Yeah? Well, kind of curious in that um, obviously a lot of these things were thought about and and included in like the Vermont Constitution prior to the federal constitution being drafted. And I'm wondering how come more of these rights were incorporated in the original constitution? In the in the original Vermont Constitution? No, in the original federal Well, when, 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 when the Constitution emerged from the Philadelphia Convention in the summer of 1787 and went out on the circuit to state ratifying conventions, one of the major objections to the proposed new Constitution, very powerful argument that it contained no Bill of Rights, Massachusetts, two vote difference would have changed the outcome. New York, one vote difference at the ratifying convention, and one of the most powerful arguments was it, the federal constitution didn't contain a Bill of Rights. The primary argument was that states already protected Bill of Rights in their state constitutions, so it was unnecessary since this is talking about simply the creation of the federal government with very limited powers. It didn't finally work, and one of the deals that was made was an agreement that if the proposed new constitution were to be ratified, the very first thing that would happen would be a proposed set of rights, a declaration of rights would go out to the people in the various states, and those since have become the first 10 amendments, including the First Amendment, which contains all the rights that we know it does. So that's a, not a terribly adequate answer, but that's the best answer I can give you, a very controversial issue. Yes? It strikes me that that uh, the other freedoms are very intuitive. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech. You know where there's a transgression or you can, you can envision the, the case. But the, the case of uh, freedom to petition seems like it sets up a, a stage for death by a thousand cuts. What is the process? And can you give an example of uh, a, a petition that was uh, made and how it came about. Let me uh, answer it by looking at the, 
state of Vermont's experience with referenda, we have had 30 instances in the course of our history where the legislature has given the voters an opportunity to give their opinion about legislation. It's been very carefully drawn that it does not give the voters the right to adopt it or to, enforce, to, to ensure its passage, but merely to inform the legislature as to what it was about. We did that with the uh, Race, horse racing. Horse racing, yeah. Uh, mutual uh, horse racing. We did it with, early on. We did it with whether we should have uh, legal, uh, accept uh, as legal tender uh, goods and goods and uh, uh, meat and potatoes and things. Green and Mountain Parkway. Green Mountain Parkway. We uh, the uh, we just celebrated the centennial of the Vermont Supreme Court building, which was the subject of a referendum in 1914, and they asked the voters the way it was written was. Shall the, uh, the, this building be constructed at a cost of $300,000? Uh, and it, it was very clear that if you voted no, uh, and should that act take effect on July 1st, 1915? And if you vote no, it'll take effect on July 1st, 1916. But it was, it was effective because 300,000 was too much for the legislature to expect that they could spend, given that the vote went against the 150,000, the, uh, the 300,000 vote, so they came back and voted a building for 150, showing our conservative qualities. All right, but the process is the government uh, presenting a, a uh, an issue to the people. It's not the people presenting an issue to the government. That's true. That's true. And Only so a, I'm not seeing where where an individual or a group of individuals uh, find a pathway to petitioning the government about a certain I Let me give you two examples. One of the examples is the case of the federal whistleblower who says, I got a grievance. My the, the part of the federal government that I work for is, is cutting corners, they're not complying with the law, and so on. The problem, you're perfectly free to, to uh, petition for redress of that grievance, then you get fired the next day. So retaliation against whistleblowers is one of the few areas where you see this right to petition still have, maybe has a little bit of purchase. Another area which I've, one of my students worked on out in, I think it was Wisconsin, was uh, a, the city council was very much in favor of expanding a local nuclear power plant, and he represented an environmental group that was opposed to it. Now, the city employees were allowed to circulate a petition supporting the expansion of the nuclear power plant, and he said, that's not right, because they're denying my environmental organization the right to use the same channels to see if we can get people to sign a petition opposed to the expansion. It's interesting, the way that's handled today is through freedom of speech. Uh, Viewpoint-based discrimination, not permitted. If you create a forum for one group, you have to provide the same forum for another group. But not, it's not treated under, technically, under the right to petition. So it's interesting the way that issue that once would have been a right to petition issue has now become a free speech issue. I was uh, mentioned before where I see the, the kind of the subterranean issues about uh, right to petition, and one of them is, oh, let me give you two errors. One of them is the uh, Vermont Public Documents Act. Uh, in order for people to effectively petition the government, they have to be able to find out what's going on, and that's the, that is stated in the Vermont Public Documents Act, the purpose of it. It's actually under the section of the statute that says uh, common rights of Vermonters. Um, and I've done a little bit of public document uh, litigation, but I'll tell you what I find, a part of it is because the, the statute is just so long and opaque, it's hard to really sort stuff out, but the general reflex of government in Vermont is to deny the, re deny the public document request and require the person requesting it to go first through the administrative appeal and then to the Superior Court and then to the Supreme Court to get the public document. And by the time you get there, it's like staler than stale. 
Um, and then if you, the other problem that we have is even though we're supposed to get, um, if you, you know, if you're a citizen's group and you hire an attorney, you're supposed to be able to get a fee shift for that, which means that the government loses, they pay your legal fees. But the Vermont Supreme Court as often as not will deny the, uh, the fees for that. So what kind of right is it for public access to documents if, that, if at the end of the day you've got to spend a lot of money to get the documents, get them on a stale basis, and then be denied your right under the statute? To, uh, to get reimbursed by the government for your efforts to make the government comply with the law. Um, the other area that really um, I've run up against a couple of times in, in constitutional cases is how the courts wield, you mentioned death by a thousand cuts, they wield things that are called standing requirements. Standing requirements are requirements that if you want to oppose something, you want to oppose a piece of legislation, you want to oppose an ordinance, you've got to show that you have standing. Uh, and standing means that you have to show that you're injured and some, that you can bring a redress of grievances. And um, I've been involved in a couple of cases where I think both the Superior Courts and the Vermont Supreme Court very unfairly denied, kicked the case out on a standing issue. And I gotta tell you, I actually came across one federal case that said, if anybody tells you, tells you there's any coherence or, in, or consistency in standing jurisprudence, they're absolutely lying to you. It depends on whether or not they like your case or not. It depends on whether or not they want to throw you out. And I got to tell you, that is absolutely the God's honest truth. I had a case a couple of years ago in Burlington. Uh, one of the plaintiffs was Jared Carter, who's a professor at the law school uh, with Professor Teachout. We had very good arguments for standing in that case, established arguments and standing in the way that the Supreme Court dealt with them. Instead, they just ignored them and said, basically, we don't like your petition. You don't have standing. One area where we should have had standing is Vermont traditionally allowed what's called <coughs> taxpayer standing. Taxpayer standing meant that a group of taxpayers could come in and bring a petition against municipal government on the theory that they're really, you know, they're screwing up and they're costing us more money than we really should uh, have to be paying and that we have to pay for. <coughs> and up until very recently, that right, and, and it, by the way, it was, it was an, uh, an analogy to what you see in a corporate law. In corporate law, there's what's called the derivative action suit. Shareholders can bring a suit on behalf of all the other shareholders to say, management's screwing up, you're violating your fiduciary duties, you're cost, costing us money. So that was sort of the municipal corporation analogy to that. But what's happened in the last, uh, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 years, and it's, sim it's symptomatic of what I see happening in legal practice all over the place, is we're now seeing that right of uh, taxpayer actions being parsed. Well, you know, Mr. Jones didn't show that he or she really, uh, you know, we're gonna get, uh, gonna get injured financially or not injured a lot or blah, 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 blah. And that was one of the things that our case in Burlington got thrown out on it. But then in another case, they allowed it. And if you wanted, you were looking for a coherent rationale for that, you can't, it's just totally result oriented. So those are the little things by which the right of petition of grievance are denied. And again, you have to understand that the right of petition, again, is not just with the legislature. A, I would say the bigger component is the right to petition either the, uh, the courts or the administrative agencies for redress of grievance. And what happens is that, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's the political culture or whatever, but there's a tendency of the court system to throw up all these obstacles uh, to protect uh, our beloved you know, city councils and school boards from these, um, from these folks and the kinds of cases that they bring. I mean, some of it is legitimate. The courts say, look, we're not in the business of running your town. That's why you elect select board members, and I understand that. But I've really seen in the last few years, in my view, uh, that that really goes overboard. And they, the, 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 you know, uh, the, the sign is uh, no room at the end. We don't want you. I just thought I'd take a minute to uh, suggest that the laws that even authorize petitions sometimes are skewed against the petitioners. If you were to have a great idea that you'd like to have a zoning change, and you were to get 5% to put together a petition, and you'd submit it to the Planning Commission, the Planning Commission would be obliged to hold a hearing, and not to touch it, they have to turn it over to the select board so it remains pure, except for maybe, you know, to get the wrong number or something. And then the select board gets it, and they're mandated to hold a hearing within a certain number of days, so we're getting a nice, you know, force here. We're, we've got a little pace going. And then they can do one of three things. They can adopt it, or they can deny it, 
or they can take no action. And if they deny it, then within 30 days, 35% can force a vote to have the vote directly made by the people instead of by the select board. But if they do nothing, the law says that that petition to force a vote on it has to wait 10 months. And that goes with what John's saying, which yep. is the aging of that right. fierce concern will have dissipated and no one will care about it. And goodness knows, if my folks ever get a vote on the sports teams, it isn't going to amount to much because it's going to be two, three years down the road. But, uh, but the principle is good. And, and uh, so this is, this is so essential to me. It seems to me that if, if the more we discourage people from, from having a say in government, the more likely government remains isolated and, and unresponsive. And where are we going to go from there? Can, can I just follow up with that, with what happened at Burlington and the F-35 vote? It was a really interesting um, sort of uh, side effect. Burlington voted, and it was by a pretty wide margin that they didn't want the plane there. And um, Winooski, if you've ever been to Winooski and had to live under the jets taking off, which I did in college, and they had the Delta Daggers in there after burners, wow. Winooski was on record of being opposed to it. But what happened as a result of the Burlington vote was then the city of South Burlington, the city council came out and said, you know what, they're really not crazy about the airplane either. And that was a result of the vote in Burlington. So your idea about opening up to this, kind of getting the, the juices flowing about discussion, your precedent really had that effect very demonstrably in this case. Yes. Uh, two questions. I'm 83 years old. So forgive me if my question is so vague you can't answer it. Uh, we're lawyers, we're in the business of vague. <laughs> Pardon? Pardon me? I said we're lawyers, we're in the business of vague. Uh, when I was a kid, I went around with my dad who practiced law up in Caledonia County. I remember one trial where he was defending several boys for disturbance of the peace with a jury. You don't see that nowadays, do you? Uh, incidentally, we, have, we still have a right to a jury trial in a criminal matter, but there are, and there, we have jury trials in civil cases, but the numbers today are amazingly low. I don't remember what they were, but they're, they're, made, they're less than like 2% of the number of cases that we've heard. But yes, that's one of your fundamental rights, to have a jury trial. And the other thing, and this, this business of the arrows. Oh, I just wanted to say, in the 1600s, the king was on top and the subjects were underneath. I'm, oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Divine, divine right of kings. But, but within the course of a century, that had been turned on its head. So the people are on top and government officials are considered their trustees and servants. Right. That's that whole notion of, of accountability that right. is the central theme of our and discussion today. So here's a case where, well, number two question. Uh, states have passed marijuana regulations, uh, taking the harness off it to a certain extent. And this was all done by legislators, uh, by, by the general public, right? In that Vermont, was, it was a legislative position. Yeah, but Vermont is the only one that ever did it from the top. I think that it looked like Western, the arrow they were, was going in a different direction. Certain Western states have the right for initiative, which means you can petition to have a law introduced and passed, or a referendum, which is that they, it will pass only if the legislature uh, or if the people approve it. Uh, but we don't have that. Ironically, we have one municipality in Vermont that has initiative and referendum, and that's Brattleboro. Uh, and it is uh, somewhat abused there, but at least it's on the books and is used on a regular basis to condemn those that don't have it. Thank you very much. Just one more question. Uh, now that I'm 83, I've talked with lawyers intermittently here and there. 
And I've never run across one that wasn't uh, affected, had, had a gut response to the fact that when they tell the, the, the lawyer whose judge is going to run things, they get a pain in their gut. <laughs> because they seem to know I've been through this before. Yeah. Is that, is that this? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> happened. Yeah. That's like the hair on the back of your neck. But I, you know, I, I, it was the familiar feeling of after losing a case and going out in the car and beating on the truck, you know, the wheel and saying everything was wrong. But after a while, you have enough of those cases in a row, you begin to think, we can't blame these people that are judges. We chose them to make these decisions, and we're going to live with them. We don't like them. We'll appeal, you know. Well, wasn't it Justice, Justice Hayes said, I, I don't know if I'm getting this, I'm paraphrasing it. He said, when you lose a case, you have three, in, three inalienable rights. One is to retire to your local tavern. The second one is to curse the court. And the third one is to take an appeal. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> There's some things I've heard on the BBC or uh, late night things that bubble up that are disturbing that the our honored president has decided to use the presidency as a, a profit center, which strikes me as uh, one of the things that was struck down during the reign of Charles the First, which came to a very abrupt end. Uh, what's going on? I, this, how can this guy keep on you know, I'm with it? Yeah, how can do it? Well, uh, are we going to have to buy a little crown for this guy? Maybe you can borrow one from Putin. I don't know if this has anything to do with the Probably get North Korea really cheap. Yeah. Okay, you ready for this? Uh oh. Okay. Three days after Trump assumed the presidency, a group in New York, led by my daughter Zephyr, sued Trump in federal court for violating what's called the emoluments clause of the Constitution, which prohibits the president or any other federal government official from using their office for personal profit. Now that particular litigation ran into a little headwind in the lower court, but it's on appeal. But another case brought by the state of Maryland, and I believe the District of Columbia, has in fact got some traction and is working its way up through the courts. So you're absolutely right to be up to object to that. It is absolutely unconstitutional, unethical. The only question is, is that the kind of problem that the courts are very well equipped to deal with. And if the courts can't do it, then maybe somebody at some point, if politics shift just a little bit, somebody ought to think about the device of impeachment. That's a little, little flat point. Anybody else want to comment on that? We have several other I, questions. I, but. I actually had a conversation with our congressman two days ago and I, about this administration. And I said, you got to understand what's going on. I don't know if you guys have watched this stuff, but this administration is like a Latin American telenovela. It's an, inter, it's an endless uh, soap opera mm -hmm. that has all these subplots. And if you ever watch those things, the subplots never get resolved. They just move on to another subplot that grabs your attention and another one and another one and another one. And it's just an endless process. And to answer your question, one of my fear is, is that people are already, it's happening to me, you become so numb to all this stuff. I mean, it's a constant deluge. You know, I just, you know, I get to the point where if I want to watch screaming and yelling, I turn the channel to Sports Center. you know, I, mean, I just, I've had enough. I saw several hands up here. Um, Jim, you have a question? Yes. Forgive my ignorance about the referendum process, please. I'm not a Vermonter uh, by birth, but, uh, What's the uh, history of binding referendum movement at, as per California hat, like California hat, in, in Vermont? And, and uh, how does the Bar Association feel about it? Well, I can't speak for the association, but I can tell you that we've never had binding uh, re uh, referenda at the uh, state level. I just want to know, is, is there a movement towards that? Is there, has there been any history of, of people trying to implement that and, and being squelched by the legislature? 
I no, I, 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 I know that, as I mentioned, the Brattleboro Charter was raised there, I, and I, I, I've written several draft charters over the time where the, where the petitioners had wanted to include it. It's not unconstitutional. It's just that it has to come in through state law. It can't be adopted by the town. It has to be a charter. The town adopts the charter, and then they send it to the legislature, and the legislature usually approves it. But there has been no state referenda at that point. And, uh, and we have to think about Vermont. You know, we celebrate it in Vermont life as the home of direct democracy, the, the, where this is where the people rule. But we really only want to see you when it's time to be elected or when we need a budget passed. And otherwise, stay home and you know watch TV. So what would it require to be a simple majority of the legislature, both houses, to invoke a, uh, to pass a binding legislature uh, referendum? No, there, there would need to be a constitutional amendment because of article, uh, section six sure. of the Vermont Constitution says a legislature decides the law. Not so the a constitutional amendment would be two thirds? A constitutional amendment requires a, a, a two-thirds vote of the Senate, a, a, a majority vote of the House, an interim election, a vote of the Senate again, and a vote of the House again, and then a vote directly to the people at the following annual town meeting. But they get rid of the 10-year time lock. Uh, we can move yeah. faster than that every four years, yeah. but, it's still con but it's controlled by the legislature. And if the legislature is made up principally of selectmen and trustees who have been reluctant to share power, you may not find them to be as responsive on that area. I, I have to say that I, by way of gentle disagreement with my fellow panelists, I, I, I testify before the Vermont legislature frequently, and I think of all the governments all of the democratic assemblies in all of the states, there probably is no other legislature which is more accessible to ordinary people than the Vermont legislature. I think, generally speaking, our legislatures are not just looking after their own political skin. I know some of them are, but I think they really are trying and have tried consistently to do the right thing and the creative thing. So. I just feel blessed to live in Vermont, in this state, as far as the operation of democracy goes, compared to any other state in the union. Now, these guys obviously disagree. Oh, I didn't, I yeah. didn't say that. I was going to, I was going to suggest one of the reasons probably that uh, initiative didn't get traction in Vermont is because we're. I mean, when I was a kid, the population of Vermont was three hundred thousand, which was what it was at the time of the Civil War. It took us a hundred. Actually, it took us a hundred years to recoup. And that's, that's a city state. I mean, that's a small population. So it's, it's pretty accountable and pretty responsible. I don't pretend to know what the history of initiative and referendum was in the, in the Western states and why that got traction there as opposed to the East. Uh, but I suspect one of the reasons that that idea hasn't gotten a lot of traction in Vermont is basically it wasn't needed. I think a lot of people would also be afraid. Keep in mind what happened, what was happening 15 or 20 years ago, a lot of these uh, initiatives were being hijacked by well-moneyed special interests that were getting very ill-considered legislation passed through uh, these public initiatives. I mean, everybody loves them. Everybody in Vermont loves them now because that's why pot got legalized in both states. But uh, you know, there's the old thing about be, be careful what you wish for, you might get it. And those have been, um, you know, abused probably isn't the word, but they've been really um, uh, taken over and, and used by uh, moneyed special interests. So that's also a consideration. Yeah. Well, they, uh, you mentioned Brownville. They have a representative town meeting. Yes. They so, uh, was there a relation between that and the initiative? It came in at the same time. Uh, they, they actually have, you know, when your 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 triad of progressive ideas is referendum, initiative, and public recall, and they have all three in their charter. And it came in at the same time. They had the representative town meeting. The representative town meeting means they elect a hundred voters and they do what people do at town meetings, say, in my town. Um, and it's now authorized by general law that any town could go to a representative town meeting system, but so far nobody has done it. And, the, and it's worth pointing out that where we have cities and we have towns, and some cities, 
such as Burlington and South Burlington, rely on a system which is more representative government than direct democracy. That's true. And the, and the, and the fights that have come out of the cities have to do with the, perhaps a little chafing by the voters that they don't have as much opportunity or as much effect in terms of reaching out to their officials to see what if they could express their opinions. It's also a question, though, of the political culture in the community in Burlington. I was involved in Burlington city government in the 80s when Bernie Sanders was mayor. But there was always a political culture in Burlington. If voters got a 5% petition for something on the ballot. Uh, the, the, the city councilors and the mayor that opposed that were doing, though, very much at their own risk. Generally speaking, those items were put on the ballot. Uh, that was just the culture there, not a similar culture in South Burlington, obviously, or in other places. So um, a lot of, in, in fact, the, these uh, non-binding referenda were in the 80s were, I mean, as, as Paul mentioned and Peter mentioned, were the bread and butter of, 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 uh, of town meeting day. I mean, there would be nuclear freeze issues, there would be all these issues that were on. That would, and one of the ideas was to bring people out and get them interested in town meeting by bringing national and international issues and putting those on, on the ballot. I believe, Adam, by the way, didn't Brad Oporo vote that if George Bush showed up in town, they would have him arrested? That's true. <laughs> That's true. More questions? Yes. Uh, I'd be very much interested in your opinion of we have so many problems, and how come in our, in our schools the students are not taught some of the truths that we all know about later on? How come, how come that, uh, you know, they can name past and speed, noun, pronoun, verb, adverb, and all that stuff, but do they know? History, from this point of view? Or do they just you know 1492, Columbus did something? And As a historian, it's always hard to defend the, uh, you know, the chronological approach to uh, history. But uh, I know that there's a constant questioning in the educational system as to whether we do enough in terms of what we used to call civics, teaching people about uh, town meeting. and. And it, it, it's shown in, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I have a lot of small town clients and, they, and they, nobody wants to run for select board and nobody wants to get involved. And this is gonna change everything because now we're starting to hear regional planning commissions saying, well, we could run these towns and we may be going away from the traditional way of, uh, of approaching, say, tra uh, highway maintenance and, and other matters. Vermont, which has a reputation as, as again, as being this uh, sanctum of uh, direct democracy, is in fact one of the most centralized uh, states other than perhaps Hawaii. We don't have any county government. We have town government where we do a lot of things, but the courts have traditionally treated the towns as, as they say in one case, mere creatures of the legislature. And so, uh, the, that's the, the only of those powers. Uh, what, how does that go with Dylan's rule? Only those powers expressly granted or necessarily implied. Right. Oh God, did I have a diet of that in the '80s when I was in the city attorney's office that's in Burlington? I mean, pardon me, if you couldn't poop because they would say the legislature didn't let you do it, mm -hmm. and we were always going down there with charter changes so we would have clear authority to do this or do that. And there's always a fight every year in government, uh, government, uh, municipal corporations, and uh, Senate operations to get stuff through. And, Many times we had char the process for charter amendments is you have to first get a referendum and get approval. And we'd have charter provisions that were passed by 65% of the voters. I was there at the time, and I remember there was a general belief that if Burlington wants it, they can't have it. Can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the no soup for you. <laughs> any more questions? Yeah. All right, do you, any of you have any closing words you'd like to offer us? We covered a lot here. I have a question for my fellow panelists on the other side. I want to get a true answer from you, John. Uh -oh. Is it not true that your grandfather was convicted for murdering somebody? 
No, that's not true. Okay. <laughs> grandfather, no. Now, who, who, shot, who shot that guy? That was my step-great-grandfather. Okay. <laughs> who shot that guy? That's our fun. Let, let me give you the story. The actual story. No, this guy got it. No, 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 no. You brought it up. You brought it up. I got the. No, the actual story was. the Barry No, the actual story was. The actual story was the anarchists were coming to bust up the meeting at the Socialist Labor Hall in Granite Street, and my great, my step great grandfather, it was not actually great grandfather, but stood out on the front step of the courthouse and fired a warning shot in the air, but he went like this. And Elia Cordy, who was the greatest sculptor in the history of the city of Barrie, happened to be looking out of the window of the second or third floor and caught the ramp oh. and was killed. And um, my, my great grandfather's name was Coretta. And he dropped his pistol and ran to the house of the nearest judge and turned himself in. He was convicted for manslaughter, not for murder. And he spent five years in Windsor Prison as a trustee of the warden, translating Italian and English for the warden. So there. <laughs> all right, and on that note, <laughs> thank you all so much for coming tonight. And thanks to all of you for coming. And thank you to the League of Women Voters and to Kellogg Hubbard Library for hosting this event. Thank you. And thanks for the notes.